What if a brain implant could turn your thoughts into text? It sounds like the stuff of science fiction, but our next guest has done exactly that. The technology holds the promise of restoring the lives of millions of people with paralysis. Please welcome Dr. Tom Oxley to the South by Southwest studio. Doctor, how's it, can I just call you Tom? Sure. Is that okay? All right, yeah. thanks. Uh, fantastic technology here. It's amazing reading about it. Uh, but before we get into it, uh, you know, technology only works depending upon the people that use it. And this, this breakthrough that you have was inspired by a person, a 40-year-old patient who has lockdown sy syndrome. Talk to us about how this patient inspired this technology that can potentially help people communicate. Yeah, so I was starting my, I'm a physician, I was starting my neurology residency. Mm. And it was in the first, my first rotation was in stroke medicine. Mm. So a stroke is blockage of a blood vessel that carries blood and oxygen to the brain. Uh, 40 is pretty young to have a stroke. I'm older than 40 now. Yeah. And at the time, he came in over the weekend. We came in on a Monday morning. He'd had a stroke to the basilar artery, which controls a part of your brain where all of the information coming out of your brain called the motor fibers that control the movement of your body were, were damaged. So all he could do was move his eyes. So locked in syndrome. Literally locked in, trapped in your own body. Yeah, you're trapped in, your, your brain is working, you're mm. there, but you're, you can't move. Um, he could move his eyes left and right. Um, 40 year old, father of three, mm. married, ran his own business, you know, peak of his life. And uh, he decided he didn't want to live like that. And so he, um, you know, we were there with the family as a horrible, decision and, um, well, processed through the decision and he decided that he didn't want to live like that and, and he passed away. Um, at the same time, you see people like Stephen Hawking, who's now passed away, um, fighting for to live in, also having locked in syndrome, but fighting down to the point where he only had a tiny part of his cheek moving on his body and he'd set up a whole system where the, the, the um, spectacle would detect his cheek moving, that would deliver a yes or a no switch wow and that's how stephen hawking wrote his last couple of books one of which impacted you know modern physics theorem yeah it's a small book there <laughs> right m theory yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. um so my experience back then was seeing okay um there's no technology available that could help people who become trapped in them now that's the most extreme version of paralysis but um that was the, the, one of the important starts of my journey to realize that this is a problem that there is no solution for. Uh, you know, you, you're talking about this, this very personal story that you had, which has, uh, oh, there you go. This is happening Other way. in real time? All right. Awesome. There you go. This, this is the South by Southwest experience. They, they, <laughs> they just come on, stay, and they're like, you know what? We're gonna give you the personal treatment. And cure. Sounds good. But you look great. Good. Uh, uh, I was like, he, she, she kept going like this to me. I'm like, is it my hair? She goes, no, it's, you look great, man. Uh, but we're talking about this, you know, this fundamental need to communicate, this fundamental need for human beings to, to just talk to each other, right? And you're dealing with folks who uh, are locked in, who, who can't do anything. So talk, talk to us about this new technology, which I wanna get it right, brain, computer, Interface. Mm -hmm. What is it? How does it work? Okay. I think the stroke example is a good place to start. The brain does a lot of different things. Um, brain computer interfaces are starting in the domain of what's called the motor system. The motor system is uh, the way that your brain dictates how you move your muscles mm. in, your, in your entire body. Um, the brain thinks, intends, has will. That signal gets carried down to your muscles and then your muscles um, act. A brain-computer interface detects what your brain wants to do and then bypasses the, the body that's no longer able to deliver that message. So if you're- It's like a rewiring, almost. It's like it, a bypass. Bi okay, so it's, just, and, 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 and how does it, how, I mean, explain it to me as, a, as I'm an unfrozen caveman lawyer, which I am, all right? So you got the, you got the BCI, it's like, all right, I got the signals, it's working, I want to do this, but my body's not responding, right? I, I, it's, the body's not taking these signals. Yeah. What then does the BCI connect to? Well, it, the brain connects to a computer. Okay. 
So we're not yet at the stage where we're reanimating the body. We've, we've just at the stage where we take the signal out of the brain mm. and create a new standard. So um, Bluetooth is an HID standard. It controls the mouse and the keyboard. The BCI will be a new standard that through Bluetooth helps you control computer systems, which then can control a number of other things. So we're building a, a new language, a new standard for control systems that in its first iteration will enable people to remotely or wirelessly um, control things over a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi network. Uh, now, when, when I hear this, right, the, maybe I'm getting too creative, right? I, I, you watch Black Mirror and Twilight Zone and you're like, oh man, BCI, chips, implants. What are we dealing with here? The type of technology, the, the physical technology, because as you know, we're living in an age with immense conspiracy theories, right? Bill Gates, brain control via vaccines and brain chips, right? So those folks who, who and by, which by the way, he's not doing that. I just wanna say that if, to clarify. But to those folks who are hesitant about this technology and who might control or hijack this technology, what do you have to say to them? Um, I would say this technology is when anyone uh, gets to a point in their life where their body is no longer doing what you want your body to do. This is not about technology that is creating superhuman powers. It's about maintaining our ability to exist in the world that we've created. Mm. Um, you know, uh, iPhones, smartphones, computers, you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is reach for your phone. You, I try not to, but I, I'm but guilty. You, but you still do it. Or if, or if you lose your phone for a minute, you're like suddenly everything stops until you find your phone. Why? Because it's the connection to your entire world. Yeah. So if the day that whoever's got concerns about where this technology is going, the day that they lose their ability mm. to engage with their body in mm. a way that they want to live in the world, that's the moment when they might consider that this technology might be useful for them. So that, that's what the technology is here to do. Is so. I know, I think that's very important because once you center it that way, it, it's not a luxury. Mm. Uh, for most people, it's survival. It's literally the need to communicate, to talk, you know, and, and Stephen Hawking's had what he had, which was able, was allowed him to produce just genius. And the rest of the folks, like that 40 year old who, if he would have had this, perhaps maybe he would have had the will to live mm. and, and go on. Um, that's important, but when you come to brain enhancement, there's others, uh, like Elon Musk, had to mention him. Uh, he is very into this, as you know. He has a company set up, and he believes that, I'm gonna, I wanna quote him. He talked about BCIs where the brain software is regularly updated, and he says, quote, I'm pretty sure you would not want the iPhone one stuck in your head if the iPhone 14 is available. Talking about enhancements and updates. That type of framing, do you think that's reckless? Do you think that's helpful? Uh, uh, I know that Neuralink are also building technology to help people who are also suffering from medical conditions. I think Elon is very good at uh, talking about a very blue sky vision. Mm. Actually, what Neuralink is doing is, is helping people. And so, I don't, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's disruptive. I think, I think he thinks on his feet a lot and he talks, you know, about all sorts of different possibilities. But the reality is like Neuralink, us said that companies in this space are working towards solving medical, medical needs. And your company is a pioneer in this space. What is your company doing? Well, what's your approach that is different, say, from some others? I don't want to call them competitors. Let's call them colleagues. Mm. Uh, the difference is, so the field is implantable brain computer interfaces. The difference is that, uh, so the technology has to get into the brain to record or listen to what the brain is doing to then bring out the information that allows the interaction with the external world. So you have to get as close to the brain as possible. Mm. Uh, our technology does not require removing open brain surgery. It doesn't require removing the skull. So our, our position, our, our intellectual property position is around delivering electronics into the brain through the blood vessel. Wow. So it's all minimally invasive. So the same way that people might get stents for their heart yeah. or their legs, we've taken the idea of a stent and then we've put an electronics package on it and found a way to deliver that up into the I brain. think you refer to it as like a secret back door, right? It's been like, you don't have to go for the, 
Because I think if you tell most people, hey, listen, we'll put an implant, but you know, it's going to require cranial surgery. Mm. Most people are like, mm, I might pass on that. But you found a less invasive way to potentially transform lives here. Yeah, it, it's, the procedure is similar to having a stent. It it's, should be performed in an outp outpatient procedure. Um, it shouldn't, shouldn't take a very long period of recovery. Uh, how long to do the surgery to the recovery? Uh, average, average. I'll, I'll, I'll get in trouble with the FDA if I make any claims. Oh, with how my, long all right, it I don't want to get you in trouble. I can but... say that uh, on average, with our, which we've published this data, that on average our first um, handful of users have been out of hospital within 48 hours. Amazing. But the procedure itself has taken a few hours. So where are we at right now, 2023, with this technology and, and getting it more accessible and getting it more sustainable and mainstream? So. This has been a multi-decade um, journey to get here. Starting, mm. a lot of this originated from US defense funding and then US government funding. Um, that was the really early stages. There was then this 20 year period of um, academic clinical work where there were experimental demonstrations that this technology really could be effective. And now in the early, in the 20s, we're getting into the commercial realm. The industry is going to emerge in the 20s. For us, we're on a, in a several, three to five year timeline of getting through our clinical trials required for commercial launch of our system. And so hopefully by the middle of the decade, we'll be ready to launch commercially. Uh, on a global scale, what countries are really leading the way? You know, in addition to the United States, what other countries do you see putting the type of investment that's necessary to really transform these lives with this uh, BCI? Uh, I'm from Australia and I came to the US for this reason. The US, mm. is, the US is far ahead of many other, as far as I'm aware, um, well, whatever's publicly available, the US is, is far ahead. And I would say a lot of that is from um, regulatory leadership from the FDA. The FDA has a very well organized office within the, neuro, the brain office of FDA that have a very clear guideline for what's required for a brain computer interface. I'm not aware of that sort of guideline in any other, um, any other regulatory body in the world. So US in this field, crushing it. This is some good news for us. It gives me some pride as an American, sir. Uh, some other things right now, we're, we're not doing that well. Uh, do you have any concerns? And, and I know I'm, I'm going back to this because we're just seeing news come out of Silicon Valley, right? I'm sure you've seen the breaking news, uh, uh, you know, FDIC, you know, all these uh, companies are losing their money. Sometimes what happens is when folks are at the cutting edge of technology, they're two steps ahead, but they don't stop to think, should we be doing this or what could go wrong mm -hmm. with this particular technology? I mean, it's invasive, it's game changer. It could literally transform lives. What's your fear? If this type of technology is put in the wrong hands, you know, what could it be? How could it be abused by the bad faith actors, let's say, and even including foreign countries? Hmm. Uh, two weeks ago, the Department of Commerce called the industry to Washington, D.C. for this exact question. Hmm. And there was a conversation between Department of Commerce and all the industry leaders about this exact question. What does um, what, does, uh, what does the use of this technology look like in bad actors? Uh, if the concept of the technology is to provide people an avenue to regain control over digital systems that you might otherwise use your hands for, mm. I think what I'd say is we're still a long way away from where the quality of that um, output of the system is equivalent to a natural you know, human um, a capability would be. If you're asking, and so, for, so from that perspective, if, if you're going to use the system to control some other system, yeah. um, would it become dangerous only if you're doing it better than a normal able-bodied human would be able to do? So I, I think that's, we're a while away from that. If I'm to go forward in time and think about, well, are there some advantages? Um, what would it look like if the technology is starting to perform, outperform a natural human body? Yeah. Then there might be potential advantages. I think the thing that springs to mind is the speed with which, so when you, you're rubbing your fingers right yeah. now, when your brain tells you to rub your fingers um, consciously, it's about a quarter of a second for the signal to go down your spinal cord, down your arm to your fingers. 
this technology could shorten the latencies with which you can control systems down to a very much shorter time frame. And, and look, you're, the intention behind what you're doing is fantastic. It can transform lives. The reason why I asked the question is putting on my pop cultural brain and thinking about this. You've been watching too much Black Mirror. There, <laughs> too much Black Mirror. Just control certain governments, enhancements, you know, uh, use not just to restore, but sometimes to damage lives. But again, what's important is that the people with the intention of this technology, such as yourself, are using to transform lives. And you have this quote, you say, connection is a fundamental need. Mm. Explain that from a brain chemical standpoint and with what you're doing. Yeah, well, what we're realizing now is in talking to a lot of the patients who um, are living through disease, living mm. through ALS, living through stroke, spinal cord injury, what we're realizing is that the thing that we take for granted is autonomy. Mm. Um, you depend on someone else to um, feed yourself or use the computer or go, or go to the bathroom or get out of bed or move around. So privacy, agency, autonomy is gone. Um, you know, the feeling you get when you've lost your iPhone for a minute and you like everything stops until you can find it again, that sort of moment of panic. Mm. And you know, what does your life become if you don't have access to digital technologies? Um, living that day by day, that is, that is what I think this technology can overcome. Continuous um, digital autonomy, connectedness all the time. And I think we take it for granted. Once you lose it, you then realize how, how much you want it back. So. I, I accept that I'm, I'm not diminishing the potential for this technology 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road to start changing the way we think about how we can engage with another and that there might be um, bad uses in the same way that um, any new tool that we use can be used in, a, used in a bad way. No, but you're talking about an aging population, right? And, and mm. sp speaking about the future of aging, we're living longer mm. and we don't have the systems that are up to date uh, to take care of us, literally. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you know, my parents are getting older, we have grandparents, and we see them in real time, you know, losing some of these functions, and we want them to live happy, healthy lives. When it comes to the future of aging, how can this technology, you think, really change uh, and make, make people who are living longer live better lives? Mm -hmm. oh, and within our lifetime, you th what, what can be achieved, do you think, in the next, say, 20 years? Oh, in the next 10 years, there is going to be a commercially available system that lets you engage with the digital landscape where you don't depend on your hands. So where, where you don't depend on your hands? Yeah. So that you, don't, you can control your iPhone without having to touch it. That's what the technology offers. Now, for you or me, that's... Yeah, wait, wait. I just, if, I, if I may, how? How does that work? So, so you've well, got your iPhone right there, yeah. around the table. Yeah. So you're just going to think it? Yeah. Yeah. 10 years, you say? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. What, what, what we're building on a 10 year, if we're successful, we should have our product out on the market within five years or 10 years um, in, that, in that time frame. But I don't, I'm not saying it's going to work better than what your hands can do. But I'm saying if your hands fail and you have no other means of accessing your computer, this is the sort of technology you might look to to restore some of that independence so that you don't have to ask someone to bring your phone to you and do some particular task, which is what a lot of people are living with. That's what paralysis causes. Mm. So that's what the technology is for. In five years, you're saying that can happen? Well, it's... 2006 was the first demonstration that that was possible. It's now 20, so that was, that was Lee Hochberg's paper in Nature. That was the um, landmark moment where a patient actually had a brain implant controlled a robotic limb. So this is not new, this has been around for a long time, but it, we ha we've had to break through this challenge around commercial scalability regulation um, to get this through. And that's uh, where one of the companies coming through looks like we might be first. And on a five year horizon, 10 year, definitely, this technology is gonna be available to people. This was awesome. Uh, researching about this was great. Talking to you was great. That's why I love South By because I get one-on-one -on -one with innovators who are actually using technology to help people. So I wish you the best of luck. Okay. Dr. Oxley, thank you for coming all the way from Australia <laughs> to America. Do this work. And inshallah, within 10 years, or hopefully five years, we could see this technology and give people a chance to live their life. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully, that first case of that 40-year-old man who had a stroke, uh, people who are listening within five to 10 years, hopefully uh, this, gives you, this gives them some hope to live and look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right.
You can find our complete schedule of interviews on our website at sxsw.com slash studio. And our studio interviews are also live streaming during the conference on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash sxsw. I'm your host, Wajat Ali. Thank you for watching.